right, I think I'm on here. I'm, uh, hey everybody, happy Saturday. Um, I'm Sean McManus, I'm one half of Spoken Garden, and uh, you can tell right now, um, my wife isn't here, Allison's not here, she says hi, she hopes you're all doing well. She, um, she says thank you to everybody uh, for the well-wishing before, when she wasn't feeling good last week when we had to cancel, we're sorry about that. Um, she had a prearranged engagement she had to go to today, and so I'm flying solo today. Uh, just bear with me with uh, the different things going on for the chat and, uh, you know, different technical stuff. Today, it's, uh, what is it? It's April 13th, Saturday. It's around noon, just a little past noon. Appreciate you being here. If you're watching in the replay, um, uh, you can say hi down below in the comments. Let me know in the chat uh, where you're gardening from and say hi. hi. Oh, and hi, Valerie. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And so, I mean, today it's kind of bare bones. I am going to do some uh, Q&A. I got some garden uh, questions here from different viewers here on YouTube. Wanted to uh, answer those and uh, maybe it'll be helpful to uh, other other people, you out there. And then um, in the chat, if you want to um, ask me some questions, I'm going to, I'm kind of just here to answer questions. So do you have any garden questions, uh, some problem you're coming up with? right now in your garden or you know you just want a second opinion on something shoot let's let's do this so this is really fun um yeah again hi valerie thanks for being here this is really fun um and moy hi from maryland hi ann thanks for being here this is fun cool what's what's the weather like in um uh, in maryland and then uh, rachel swope hi hi rachel yeah rachel uh let me know where you're from um, where you're gardening at? Down there's Kevin. All right, Kevin. Woo! Awesome, buddy. Thanks for being here. Uh, Valerie, I know you're here in Washington State in the Kent Valley area. I think you said before you let us know, so that's super cool. If your weather's anything like ours, it's nice and sunny. It's kind of mild, but a little cool, but there's a lot of sun, so we're really happy about that. Um, yeah, we have a, um, we've got some plants growing um, in our garden out here, in the landscape out here. Um, like, uh, what is it? There's rosemary, there's lith lithodora, um, a couple other plants we have out here. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been really nice, though. They're flowering. So Sabrina Fitzpatrick. Hi. Hi from Georgia. Hi, Sabrina. And then Valerie. Valerie says, uh, I read about watering deeply and less often. How do you know how much is let is deep? Good question, Valerie. Really good question. Yeah, let's start it off. So the whole concept between water less but water deeply is the concept of so less watering time, less less days of watering. Uh, so if you think about um, the frequency of watering is less, but when you water, you water more um, for longer. And the concept is, is when you do that, the water stays in the soil longer. It, it penetrates down into the soil the water does and it stays there for longer so if you have more deeply rooted plants like some trees or any shrubs even grass grass might um might surprise a lot of you out there different turf especially here out in this, uh, the pacific northwest if you have lawn out in your front yard your roots will get down they'll get maybe 12 maybe 18 inches deep and it's kind of crazy to think about but that you know that grass you keep mowed at about three three and a half inches or so those roots go down really deep. They have really deep roots, or they can. And so a lot of people say, well, especially for water and to conserve water around here, water less frequently, but water deeply. So in, instead of watering on a regular water schedule for your irrigation system, let's say, you don't set it for five to 10 or 15 minutes every morning or you know every early morning and have that go you know either every day or every other day. You'll water for say more like 20 to 30 minutes and you'll do it maybe twice a week as an example and so that's that's less frequency but you're watering deeper you're watering more you could also tweak that a little bit if you don't have really um if you don't have really um sorry call coming in ah. um if you really don't have uh well draining soil you could still do the frequency of every probably you know 15 minutes or so uh, do a do a span of 15 minutes of watering and you know do that maybe two or three or four times in the morning space them out you know 15 minutes on 15 minutes off 15 minutes on 15 minutes off something like that cycle it through that way but only do that about every 
two, maybe three days a week instead of doing, you know, one or two cycles of 15 minute waterings every morning. So that's the whole concept. And I hope, um, oh, and you asked Valerie, what, how do you know it's deep enough? Get your cycle down, get your, your consistency down on watering deeply, you know, watering a lot longer, but less, less frequently, get that down and then find somewhere where you can dig in the soil and dig down into that soil profile so you can see it or take a core sample. There's, there's different ways to take core samples with a tube and you just push it down in and then bring it back up and you can look at the profile of that tube of soil and you can see where the moisture is getting to. So either dig down and dig a hole and try and figure it out um, if it's getting down deep enough or use a, a core sampler and figure it out that way. And you can see on the profile of the soil where the moisture is. And that's how you would literally know if you're getting deep enough or not. I hope that helps, Valerie. Does that help? And I see right there, you said, ah, that makes sense. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, let me know if that helps, Valerie, if that's if that's helpful there. Um, Rachel Swope, I'm also from Maryland. Oh, it's rainy and windy. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, stay hunkered down and stay stay dry, stay warm. Um, Valerie says, cool, sunny day here. Perfect for gardening. Yes, right? Super fun for gardening. It's a great day here for gardening too. And then Ann Moit's beautiful 75 there, but quite windy. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, I hope, I hope the wind dies down for you there, uh, Ann. And then Ann says, have you ever grown spaghetti squash or butternut squash? Um, it will be my first time. Any tips? Okay. We haven't grown it in the last couple of years because uh, we haven't had the setup. We grew it uh, probably three or four years ago at our old house. Um, we found with squash in general, um, it's definitely something here in the Pacific Northwest. We don't plant it out into our garden, especially as start as start plants, like smaller plants, like just above seedling stage until about middle of May, um, either, either during or right after Mother's Day. And that's because of our cooler nights out here, especially further inland. Um, you can start seeds, I think after, if I remember right, I don't have anything in front of me, but I mean, you probably vet this with uh, your seed packet if you're growing up by seed. Um, look at, look at the seed packet. It should say something along the lines of start outdoors, you know, after the threat of frost is passed in your area, but also, um, the soil temperature needs to be probably at least 50 or 60 degrees on average. And that's kind of hard to, that's kind of hard to, to figure out because nobody's going around measuring soil temperature. So one way to do it is look at your average, like nighttime temperatures, cause that's the coolest time of day. Go by your average nighttime temperatures and see if they're around 50, 55, 60. And once they reach that average, plant your seeds outside, direct sow. Um, if you're gonna start them early, yeah, start them inside, keep that soil temperature up until they germinate and start to grow. You don't want it to get too cold cause that'll slow their growth down. And also you don't wanna place them out uh, in your garden and let them get a lot of moisture, like too much, um, like, too, like human conditions, they are susceptible, a little bit more susceptible, like different mildews. I can't remember the specific one is powdery mildew or yeah, I'm one of those. And so keep an eye on that. Um, and definitely don't overhead water, water down at the soil level. So you don't, um, encourage fungal or weird, um, infections or anything on the surface of the, um, uh, of the leaves. Yeah. Um, something we did for, was it a squash? I think it was a squash last year. We did grow a squash, not a spaghetti squash. Um, once it started to grow the actual squash for the, um, yeah, on the, on the plant, on the vine, we took a piece of cardboard and put it underneath it. So it wasn't directly on the soil. And so that cut down on, uh, bugs taking chunks out of it or other critters and moisture, uh, being right up against it, whether it's on the ground or, or wood chip. And that helped, uh, keep it healthy and a lot more, uh, just look better, you know, it's healthy. So I hope that helps. So, yeah. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay. So looks like, looks like we're, we're there. We're doing good with the questions. Keep them coming guys. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and again, if you're just joining, um, I'm running solo today. Allison's, uh, at a predetermined, uh, uh, event that was already planned. So, um, yeah, she trusts me enough to do this. So we're seeing how this goes. This, uh, this is a first time. So definitely want your feedback on this. Uh, and, oh, cool. Great. Yeah. Hopefully that works for you. Hopefully that's helpful. So without any more questions in the chat, 
I am going to go through some of these uh, these questions here I got. So the first one I have, this was a couple of days ago from David Smith dash VZ nine U U. David Smith asked, can I divide candy tuft? And so there's a couple different plants out there that are named candy tuft is just common names. And um, I already responded to David Smith on this, um, but I specifically answered it from the standpoint of um, if he's talking about the plant Iberis Semper virens, which is the uh, hardwood perennial candy tuft, and it blooms. It has it has kind of finely uh, finely it has fine leaves, smaller leaves. Um, it grows as a mound. Um, it doesn't get more than probably about two two or so feet tall, but um, it has nice white little flowers, and it blooms this time of year in different cooler times of year. So definitely the fall, and if you have a relatively mild, uh, sorry this time of year in the spring. And then if you have a, a mild fall, it'll bloom that time too. Um, so it spreads as a perennial on a crown. And so like a couple other plants, if you've ever grown Shasta daisies or um, even uh, cone flowers, what'll happen is, is that crown grows in size and it spreads um, on this crown or this disc where the buds are connected to the actual roots of the plant. And so when that when that plant any plant not not only candy tuft this Iberis sempervirens or um, echinacea or sh- uh, shasta daisies it gets about two to three years old in your garden it's nice and healthy and it's it's a good size you can then divide it and I say two to three years two to three years old because you want a little bit of maturity in the plant so it has some strength to it. And once you cut it, once you once you divide it literally in half, you can divide them in half or in smaller chunks if you're feeling really confident that you can keep those plants alive in the smaller ones. Um, you'll be able to move them around your garden. And so the maturity helps because the more mature the plant is, you know, two, three, four, even five years out, it's going to have a larger crown. The larger the chunks you take off of that plant and the larger the chunk you leave where the plant is, the better its survival rate, the better it'll snap back after the stress of literally having chunks of it taken away and the faster it's going to come back with health and all the blooms and stuff. So that's why I always suggest about at least two to three years old, if not a little bit older for those crowns. So yeah, you just literally, you got, you got your plant, you got your crown disc where those, uh, the shoots and the roots meet, take your shovel, literally cut it in half with your shovel dig the rest, dig one half out and keep as many as those roots as you can, and then go transplant it and put it in a new place in your garden or give it as a gift or whatever you're doing with it. So yeah, it's totally possible to do it that way, um, uh, to, to divide your candy tuft. Some people, I mean, this time of year you can do it if it's blooming, you might want to wait until it's done blooming. So you don't interrupt that whole process, but you can do it while it's blooming. Just realize that once you do that, it'll shock the plant and it'll pro- it'll possibly um, shut the blooming down, either for the rest of the year or um, delay the rest of the blooming until later on after it's recovered uh, from that division. The plants you divide that blooming, if they're in bloom, that blooming is probably going to shut down, and that's just the plant's normal response. So it's perfectly okay, but if you can wait till the plant's either done blooming or do it before it's bloomed uh, this year, and that should be okay. So I hope that helps, Dave. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> Let's see in the chat here. Um, Br- Brian Mack checking in. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you being here. No, I'm not sure. Oh, hey, that's my brother. Hey, brother, thanks for being here. Brian Mack's my brother. So, okay. Um, Ella Ashby, will my lily turf spread enough to be invasive? Um, that's a good question, um, Ella. Um, it depends. It depends on where you're having it grown. Um, are you meeting all its needs for its growth? Um, also, depending on where you live. So, uh, Eli, I don't know where you live, and you can let me know if you want. But really, this goes for everybody, wherever you live. You need to check. If you're worried about a plant being invasive, you need to check with your uh, either county extension agency or noxious weed board. There's something in each state called a noxious weed board. And then, so for the state, they have the noxious weed board, and then it's broken down by county for the noxious weed um, group for that county. So county noxious weed board, state noxious weed board, that type of thing. And you can find them online pretty fast. 
So if you're worried about your lily turf uh, being really invasive or the possibility of being invasive, check um, the lists on those county uh, noxious weed uh, websites. They, they all should have a list of some type that lists out the most invasive, medium, kind of moderate invasive, and the least invasive, but they're still invasive. If your plant's on that list, then there's a chance it's got some level of um, being invasive in your in your garden, in your area, but go by county if you can. Tr try to find the state, but you can definitely just go for like out here, uh, well, back, back into Tacoma, it's in Pierce County, so it would have been the Pierce County Noxious Weed Board. It's kind of a mouthful, but if you, if you look for that online, you should find their website and then they should have some type of navigation to find those noxious weed lists. If you're not sure, if it's still not on there, you can always call your um, county extension agent or definitely get in contact with the noxious weed boards. Um, they should have a contact uh, number or email and you can, you can ask them directly because um, I, don't, I don't think I'm very familiar with Lily Turf. So I'm sorry I can't answer that a little bit better, Ella, but um, I hope that helped. So, yeah. So thank you for your question. That was cool. So, okay. So getting in here a little bit more. Um, so we answered Dave's question. Um, oh, and by the way, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me. Oh, Ella, you just said Southern Illinois. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Check with your, um, your Illinois state noxious weed board and go from there. Um, whatever County you're in, in Southern Illinois, uh, find that county not just weed board and then you can deep dive into that and figure that out like I was discussing before like I was talking about before so yeah um, yeah you bet you bet Ella cool so um, frosty 2 let's see what frosty 2 has here so I asked earlier this week is it a bad idea to wait until the new growth has started to then prune the dead parts and this was from this was asked on the video uh, one of our shorts recently spring mum pruning for larger plants oh maybe that was from last year but anyway so that was from our short spring mum pruning for larger plants so and again frosty asks is it a bad idea to wait until the new growth has started to then prune the dead parts yeah that's not that's not a bad idea at all in fact if you wait until i mean you can follow our advice on that uh, on that short that works too but Literally, if you wait for the plant to start growing and see where it's growing, where it's not growing, that's a great way for you to just watch for the plant to tell you exactly where to prune. Totally. That's a, that's a really good way to do it. So no worries at all, Frosty. Really good question. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for telling me. Sounds awesome. I was worried about that. I kind of had to run through this this morning. So really quick, before I get into the next question, um, Allison and I presented to the King County Master Gardeners Program, the Bellevue um, Demonstration Garden Group about bare roots and bulbs. And so that was earlier this morning. So coming from that to this, and Allison heading out after our, our presentation, I didn't have much time to figure all this out. So that's why I'm kind of like, can you hear me? How's this sound? So, um, so anyway, little story on that. Oh, um, Miss Alex M. Oh, you were talking okay you guys are talking never mind <laughs> okay i'm solo this is new okay next question from earlier this week from jenny or jen martinez 995 um and she asked this they asked this from the uh video how to prune weird growth thinning cuts that was a short we put out about maybe a couple weeks ago maybe a month ago they asked after thinning or pruning quote unquote no more than one third of the plant and there's more that needs to be removed out of the plant that they pruned on. How much time between prunings is needed before they can actually go through and prune some more on this plant? So that's a great question. It's a really common question too. Um, when you're pruning any plant, you definitely, like uh, Jenny Martinez 995 said, um, you definitely don't want to prune out more in one pruning, basically in pretty much one year, but you can kind of fudge on that depending on the plant. You don't want to prune out more than a third of its total canopy. And the reason for this is because you don't want to shock the plant. Um, you don't want to stress it out too much and you don't want to shock the plant with that removal of that much more material to then have a flush of new growth. It's almost like stress growth. It's almost like a, it's like a stress reaction to, um, to what you just did to pruning the plant. You don't want that because then that can create more, not only work, 
but other problems later down the road for more pruning. So that's why we always say, in general, don't prune out more than a third of any plant at any time. Now, the caveat in a whole year of pruning out more than a third of the plant over a whole time span of a year is if the plant is a really profuse grower. If, let's say, it's uh, English laurel. English laurel, here in the Pacific Northwest at least, we can prune that plant at least twice a year, if not three or more times a year. And I'm talking like hard pruned down to at least a third of the canopy, sometimes more depending on if you need to do that or not for safety or whatever. <clears throat> but you can prune out at least a third of that plant, like in the, basically in the early spring, possibly early to mid summer, if it's not too stressful and too warm. And in the fall, because it grows and it just reacts, um, so fast with so much growth that's one of those plants where you can definitely prune out a third once in the once in the early spring once in the early summer and once in the early to mid fall because it does grow back so much so that's an example but for most plants in general for their health and not to stress them out too bad and to get any die back or anything like that or open them up to stressful uh, to the stress of having you know then the secondary stress of disease or pests coming in because the plant is stressed out just prune out one third of the canopy for a year. So, um, so yeah, so it kind of depends on the plant. So again, if you have like an English laurel or let me see, uh, different kinds of grasses, there's different kinds of grasses that will literally just, they're so profuse. You can cut them at least two times a year. Um, yeah. So just keep that in mind. So if they, if they do have that profuse growth, you can cut them, you can prune them more than once a year and prune out each time a third of that canopy, but just make sure it's the right type of plant to do that too. Otherwise, just prune out one third once once a year, and then work it over the long term. Do the long game of a third this year, a third this year, and a third this year, and you know work it that way. So I thought that was a really good question. Um, let me see here. Let's check back in the chat here. Okay. So I think. Okay, so the Divide's here. Thank you, Divide, for being here. And uh, let's see. Oh, Liriope. Okay, yeah, I got you. Liriope, Lily Turf, Liriope. I've grown, I've planted and grown, grown Liriope before. Um, yeah, that's good advice, the Divide. Yeah, totally. Um, L. Ashby, can I raise hostas in the chat here? Can I raise hostas in a pot? They get huge. They do. They do get huge. We actually, uh, Allison and I are growing hostas in pots exclusively and you just need to size them right. Um, if you have a smaller hosta plant, um, you can get away with having like a smaller plant. Like it only gets about maybe like this tall and maybe like this wide. It's pretty young. You can get away with putting that in maybe first planted into maybe like a, you know, an, a 16 or even 20 inch pot and you can leave it there for a couple of years because it'll take a while for the roots to really fill in that whole area in the soil and for the top of the plant to fill out. Once you reach that point, yeah, you're going to have to either pot it up into a new pot, a new size pot, a bigger pot, or find somewhere um, in the garden where you can plant it and it can reach its mature size without having to replant it all the time. So that's that's what I would tell you. It's totally possible to put it in a pot, though. So I would I would do it if you have the chance because it's it's easy to do. Or if you have like a patio, you don't have a full uh, garden. Um, you just have a patio garden. You can definitely put hostas in containers. So that's really that's really fun to do. So and also, uh, hostas technically are a bulb, um, but they're a herbaceous perennial. You can divide them once they get too big in that one pot. Once they start outgrowing the one pot, you can literally divide them. And you could, uh, you know, cut it in half once it gets too big, keep the one piece of it in that same pot you've been growing it in, and then place the new plant that you divided off, put that into um, a new pot. Now you've got two hostas, right? Or two pots full of hostas. So you can treat it like that too. So just because the plants get a lot bigger um, than possibly the pot's going to let them uh, get to doesn't mean you can't still grow them in the pot. So I hope that helps. So, um, yeah. So... Let's keep going here for the Q&A. Okay, so up next, Kim Roach O4RZ. <clears throat> and this was from 
um, our video. This question was from our video, Cordyline Care. Oh, this is part of our series, our, our whole year series of, of gardening. SGD Day um, 351. Cool. Okay, so Kim Roach asks, I have a large bright yellow cone of leaves at the top of my cordyline. What is it? So this, this is an interesting question because our cordylines, we grow cordylines too. And, uh, Kim Roach, if it's anything like our cordylines, um, we've been growing them for a number of years. Something to know about cordylines in general is they don't start flowering in general. Some, some cordylines are different, but most cordylines, they won't start flowering till like six to 10 years of age. And by that time, most cordylines, if you're growing them correctly, you know, you got them in the right location, give them enough water and nutrients. And they're staying healthy and they haven't died or been uh, hurt by, you know, any of the cold temperatures maybe in your area. They get really tall. And so this maturity at this mature stage, once they get, you know, big enough, they'll start to flower. Well, six to ten years is roughly when they will flower after all their needs are met and they're nice and happy in your, in your garden. Their flowers at first come off the stem up top, close to the tip. Um, the growing tip, but not on the growing tip, obviously, because how they grow. But it comes off the main stem uh, below the growing tip, and they look like this cone. And they could be, they can be different colors. Yellow is one of them, but um, it's their flower. Their flowers grow off this way, and they they start to look like this pro profusion, protrusion, protrusion of um, like like a cone coming off. And then as they come off, they get bigger and bigger, and they develop. And the flowers. That, that's how they flower. So I think, Kim, what you're looking at is a flower of your cordy line. And congratulations. That's super cool because that's that's definitely a milestone in the age of your cordy line. And that's really cool. We haven't had ours. Uh, ours aren't big enough or mature enough yet to flower. So a little bit jealous that you got yours to flower. We haven't gotten ours to flower yet, but really cool. So nice job, Kim. So and hopefully that helped other people out there. Um, and, um, check in the chat, not seeing any new questions again, guys, if you guys have got any specific questions that I can, I can help you with, um, let me know in the chat, you know, and if you're watching this in the replay, uh, ask us down below, we're here to Q and a, I'm here to Q and a today and, uh, just, just talk with you guys and uh, help you out in your garden. So, so our last question that I have here, um, from Albert, Albertina Fernandez, two four four zero this was from our gladiolus lovers uh, video they asked how deep should i plant my gladiolus bulbs good question because it's tricky and i've got some bulbs here too if you guys want to talk about bulbs today we can get into it this is fun right now i've got this uh Sparaxis harlequin flower mix bulb right here little bulbies and then uh before i answer this question i want to show you this we've got um some crocosmia these are cool I can show you these too. These are uh, corm. These these look like a true corm. Super cool. And then what we got here is we've got oh we've got irises, bearded irises. So fun. Anyway, so enough show and tell. Okay, so the reason it's tricky for planting bulbs in their depth depth is because on packages of those bulbs they'll give directions hopefully um, of how deep to plant them and their spacing and whatnot. But depending on the size of the bulb is the trickiness of it, because just because in general directions on a package, it says, you know, in general, most gladiolus bulbs, you're supposed to plant them five to six inches, right? They're really close. In general, a lot of people say plant them, you know, five to six inches deep. Well, that's no different than your tulips or your daffodils. But just like tulips or daffodils, those bulbs and their size they range in size. They're not all the same size all the time. Some bulbs are sold smaller, some are, sm some are sold a lot bigger. And so depending on the size of your gladiolus bulbs and your other bulbs in general, um, you can plant them. A good way to do this is if you're not sure, look at the bulb height and then double or triple that height for the depth. So let me get this out here. Let's see. I've got this here and so for for also before i show you this um gladiolus if uh if you have like a medium sized larger bulb the general rule of thumb is about four to five inches but again you can use the uh, you can use the size of the bulb to figure that out so this is fun so this is yeah this is the uh the crocosmia so the crocosmia here 
So we've got about, it's about an inch. So for these on this size, I would say plant these about three inches deep. And on the package, oh wow, on the package, it says plant five to eight inches deep. That seems a little deep because usually even the larger bulbs for, um, what I don't want to say, like the hyacinths or the alliums, they go eight to nine inches deep. And those bulbs are huge. I mean, those, you know, they're usually about this big around. They're usually like this. So, I mean, I guess we could, if we wanted to plant it, plant these, um, you know, five to eight inches deep, I'd maybe go five. I mean, that's, that's an inch, you know, you know, may, maybe five inches max on these, but I mean, that's a good rule of thumb doing this. And you should be able to hit that depth, the right depth relatively closely. If it says on the package, use that depth too, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't plant these more than five inches deep. That's, that's too deep. I think after that. So anyway, so yeah, so that's cool. You guys ever seen crocosmia bulbs before? Pretty cool. Anybody planting crocosmia bulbs? Um, oh, the divide. Cheers. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Love your content. Oh, thank you. Oh, cool. You're a former Washington state extension master gardener. Awesome. Cool. Uh, go Cougs. Woo. Yeah. Um, and then Valerie says, um, doing a great job solo. Oh, thank you, Valerie. I know I'm a little, I know I'm talking a little fast today, but uh, I'm a little nervous being here, uh, solo, not used to this, but you know, trying it out, got to try new things. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, the divide says, do you have a Pacific Northwest favorite must have plant? That is a really good question. The divide a must have plant from the PNW. There's so many to choose from, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of times I go with the natives, um, and, um, Salal. I love Salal. That's a really good one from the PNW. Um, if you're looking for a bulb, the one that always sticks out to me is the, um, is the trilliums. Um, and they're a, they're a bulb found in our forests underneath really, really dense shade. They come up um, out of the ground. They only get about maybe, you know, four or five, maybe six inches tall max. And they have little flowers. They have like a tri petaled flower. And I, I love those. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Salal and uh, yeah, um, yeah, really fun. Um, do you have a favorite Pacific Northwest um, plant, the divide? Anybody else out there? Let, let me know in the chat if you have a favorite plant. Um, that's a fun question. Um, yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, I mean, that's all the questions I have for um, that I came up with. I didn't realize I was going to go through them so fast. <laughs> so, but, um, you guys want to talk about bulbs? I got bulbs here. Um, so let's see these, these crocosmia, these are a type of bulb called a corm as opposed to the, um, the daffodils or tulips, which are actually a true bulb. So there's five different types of bulbs. If you don't know, maybe you've heard me say this before. I maybe didn't. So there's, there's, there's true bulbs, there's corms, there's tuberous roots, there's tubers, and there's rhizomes. And so a corm is similar to a daffodil. And I'm sorry, I don't have the daffs here, but maybe, let's see, I think the sporaxis, let me get these. Is this already open? Oh, not open. Let's open it up really quick here so we can do a comparison. So, okay. Yeah, I think, I think these are, uh, oh, thanks brother. <laughs> thanks man. Yes. So I, I'm going to take a, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm gonna take a wild stab at it. Cause that's what it looks like here. Um, the Spraxis, I think are a type of, um, true bulb. And I can see that with this here. Yeah. So you can see the Spraxis is tiny teeny tiny, but there's a growing tip here. And then on the bottom, there's where the roots would be. And so this is a true bulb. And so the reason I know it's a true bulb, because it's got a tunicate. It's got, um, I'm looking at this thing here. Okay. Um, it's got a tunicate or a paper covering on it. 
And so that is very indicative of a true bulb. Also, it, it kind of resembles a Hershey Kiss um, in its shape. And that's also indicative of a true bulb. They do kind of look like that. Um, not all of them do, but some of them do. So a true bulb has um, leaf scale tissue inside and it's layered. And so it has that on the inside. It also has a basal plate on the bottom. You can see right there. And um, that's where the roots grow from. And that's where um, it reproduces from with little bulblets or bulbils or not bulbils. Not bulbils. Bulbils are, are on the top of the plants. Sorry. Um, bulblets um, or bulbils. No, bulb, no, no, sorry. Not bulbils. I'm Cormels. Cormels are from corms. There's an equivalent to the to the regular bulb, so never mind, whatever. Um, so bulblets, remember bulblets. So that's how that that's what the structure is on a true uh, bulb. Corms are similar to um, a true bulb, where they have a basal plate and they have a top growing point for the stem, but they have solid tissue on the inside. They don't have an overlay of modified leaf scales that make up. The tissue it's just solid there's no differentiation in that in that uh, tissue and another way to look at this is um for a true bulb onions when you cut an onion open you got all the layers right you peel back the layers of an onion that's a true bulb um, when you cut open a um, a corm you're not going to find that so that's that's the uh, that's the main difference between a corm and a true bulb so oh Lucia. so let's let's keep going here um, Valerie says, favorite plant, uh, Pacific Northwest plant, bleeding hearts, columbine. you got a lot of them. So hostas, yep, we, we have, you can grow hostas here. Brunera, uh, spotty dotty. I don't know if I'm familiar with that, Valerie. That's a fun one. Um, I'm dividing up some daylilies right now. Woo, cool. Awesome, Valerie. Um, the divide says, erythronium is my favorite native. Oh, yes, erythronium. Now I can't. Um, the species, Acuminatum, no, Colonoides, Solenoides, ah. so yeah, that's a native bulb here, and that is super fun, there's actually a lot of erythroniums throughout the whole United States, east coast, west coast, so super cool, good job, oh, and Luisia, of course, Luisia is a, a great native around here, um, yeah, so really cool, you guys, yeah, keep that going in the chat, I want to hear more, so I'm going to put these back, um, I've got these irises. Okay, so, okay, irises. I want to make sure these aren't goofy. These are kind of goofy looking. I think they're still alive. So, irises. Irises are another type of bulb. This is fun because, like the corm and the true bulb, irises are an underground modified stem of storage for the bulb to grow from, right? So, this is a modified stem itself. It's a horizontal stem, though. It doesn't, it's not flat like the corm or disc-like. It doesn't have a basal plate. Um, it, it's not teardrop shape. This is, this is a small um, iris. And you can see right here, there's the underground stem. It's horizontal. Maybe if I go like this too. Yeah, there we go. So here it is. It's a horizontal stem. And sometimes it's partially buried in the soil. So the top is exposed to the air and the bottom isn't. Or sometimes it's fully um, buried, but most of the time for like irises, they're partially buried in the soil. So, and on irises, the way they're different too, not only because they're horizontal and elongated stem tissue, but they only grow from a certain point on that stem at one end. They will not grow from the other end over here. So right here, we've got a couple of growing points here on this side of the stem where the old stem was from last year. And then we've got another uh, portion of it it wants to grow there too. The roots are always on the bottom of that horizontal stem on uh, rhizomes. Doesn't matter what rhizome it is, if calla lily or an iris, um, there's other examples too. Those roots are always on the bottom. They're never up on the top. They're never coming from anywhere else except the bottom. So that's, that's one way to know you're looking at a rhizome. So that's fun. And then the tubers and tuberous roots. Tuberous roots, uh, a great example of tuberous roots are dahlias because they have multiple stems radiating out from a central point where the buds usually come up um, either on that central point of that stem 
or just off of that central point. And it's, it's uh, radiating um, stem tissue, uh, swollen elongated stem tissue off of that central point. That's a tuberous root. Tuberous roots are the only bulb that are actually more roots than modified stem. So that's fun. Um, the other one is a tuber. That's still an underground modified stem structure for storage. Sorry, I got a fly thing in front of me here. Um, and so a tuber, so potatoes, right? Potatoes, who doesn't like potatoes? Potatoes are fun. So they're different from all the other bulbs because they don't have a certain area at all where the roots or the shoots will grow from. It's chaos across the whole structure um, on, its, um, on its surface. Roots and shoots will come from almost anywhere. So when you have um, a good example is this, you had a potato and you see all the nodules, it's getting a little bit older, it's getting squishy and it's, you start getting the growing nodules around all the surface of it. Those are roots and or shoots, depending on what they're going to develop it into. So you can always take it when it gets to that point, go plant it in the ground and you'll get a potato plant. So anyway, and you might get some more, uh, you might get some more potatoes. That'd be fun. Um, yeah. So another example of a tuber is an elephant ear. It's a little bit different on how it grows its roots and it shoots out of that elephant ear as a tuber, but it still has no differentiation in certain on a certain area where any of those shoots grow or where any of the roots grow. They might be a little separated and there's a little bit, there's a different way to orient them to plant, but, um, really it's still chaos where they come out at on the top or or on the sides or on the bottom of the shoots and the roots um, we made a video about planting elephant ears a while back um, if you're not familiar with it go check it out you can find it on our channel super cool makes it really easy um, you got to find the concentric rings on the bulb itself on the older ones and that's how you find out where if it's up or down how to orient its planet all of this anatomy is important because it helps you handle the handle the bulb and make sure you plant it right and know what to expect uh, for growth. You don't want to plant them upside down because um, that makes it really hard for the bulb to grow, you know, down and then up again. If it uses all of its energy to grow down and then back up to make it out of the soil, it might not flower. You might not even see the bulb. Um, you might not you might not ever see it because it won't have enough energy if you plant it too deep to go down and come up. So all these things I think are just super important, and I'm just just feel like I got to tell you about this today. So really fun. So, um, got some stuff going on here in the chat. Let's take a thing here. This, the divide, my spotty dotty didn't make it. Oh, sorry, divide. Um, sorry that happened, but yeah, hopefully, um, you'll get another one. Do better next time. You know, all that. This is how we grow. Um, pun intended, um, in, in gardening, you gotta have, you gotta have those times when, uh, things don't go the way you want them to, or you thought they were going to go. And that's how you learn, right? So it's all good. So, I mean, that's how, that's how I've learned a lot of things in gardening. So, well, yeah, guys, I think, I think that's it. Um, yeah. Thanks brother. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think that's it for now. I don't see any other new questions coming. Let's see the question about, okay. So the divide says the question about preventing soil fungus nets don't overwater if you have a gentle breeze over your planting area that will deter them. That's true. Yeah, definitely don't overwater. Um, yeah, you don't want to encourage. They thrive in the moisture uh, of the soil. And so, yeah, if you can, e even if you can um, let the soil dry out just a little bit on top um, and then water, uh, maybe quarter of an inch, half an inch, that'll help control also um, that moisture level. So maybe something to think about, um, to not have fungus gnats. So, okay, guys, well, um, oh, it's been fun. Say hi to Allison for me. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I will guys. I will uh, let me know in the chat, uh, or excuse me, let me know in the comments down below. If you're seeing this in the replay, if you have any questions or anything's going on, you want to, you want to chime in and, uh, what's your favorite plant to grow. That'd be super cool to know. And thanks everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. This has been fun. And my first solo, uh, live event. So yeah. So have a great uh, afternoon guys. Thank you for being here and we'll catch you next time. Okay. See you later.